I'll give a quickly introduce Jianbo. Um, so Jianbo, uh, she is a professor at UPenn. We're very excited to have him. I think most of us are already quite familiar with his work. Um, just a quick bio about him. Uh, Jianbo studied CS and math as an undergrad at Cornell University. Uh, he then received his PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley in 1998. Um, uh, his thesis was on normalized Hutz image segmentation algorithm. Uh, he then joined the Robotics Institute at CMU in 99 as a research faculty. And since 2003, he's been with the Department of Computer and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Gianbo's group is developing vision algorithms for both human and image recognition. Uh, the ultimate goal is to develop computational algorithms to understand human behavior and interaction with objects in videos, um, and to do so at multiple levels of abstraction, uh, from basic body limb tracking to human identification, gesture recognition, activity inference, and a lot more. Um, so Gianbo and his group are working to develop a visual thinking model uh, that allows computers to understand the surroundings and achieve higher level cognition abilities, such as uh, machine memory and learning. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, mental models of humans in an escape room from a first person point of view. So we're all very excited to hear about this. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Yeah. So I'm very happy back to Columbia for after many, many years. I don't know when's the last time we actually I guess it was years ago. And I really loved it. So, and in fact, I, I think I would say that uh, many of my research topics actually did about to the three years I spent at CMU, where I saw a lot of robots and I thought about building a robots and do something with robotics, but never got to do it. And uh, this particular work, actually, first person, you know, uh, uh, first person vision is inspired by what Tegu was uh, doing right before you know left CMU and gave me this pair of uh, first person glass uh, to work with. And I have absolutely no idea what that's about. <laughs> so, I, and I always knew that the key was 10 years ahead of time. So I think I have 10 years to work on. <laughs> but I didn't realize 10 years is already coming up. So um, without uh, too much uh, of background, so I would just start showing. Uh, uh, <laughs> so some of the prior work I've done on first person video. So the question is, what is the first person video? Why is it about any other video? Uh, to me, the first thing is that the first person video uh, is able to tell you what are you paying for. So this is the work that we've done to show that we can actually uh, understand what we're looking at, what we're paying attention to without even a gaze. So this is the days of where I just sort of stick my head out and say, maybe I can understand what people are thinking just by looking at a video of what it's doing without even a gaze. So we trained the system at the beginning to a surprise method and later using the machine learning method to basically uh, identify where uh, the objects of interest are. So on the right is ground truth, on the right is what uh, machine predict. Sometimes it predicts some extra stuff, but sometimes the extra stuff will predict it to turn out to be actually reasonable when we open the fridge. Um, so when we ask a human to the label, we ask them to uh, pay only attention to this absolutely this clear thing. And don't draw anything that's not short. Like in the grocery store, it's not short, which you want to do. There's crap, just don't play anything. So he's kind of under reporting. So this is a contrast of what the human is labeling versus what the computer is learning. This is a supervised and supervised. So, so the stuff that is pay attention to are both tactile, the hand driving something, it's also visual, it's looking at it. Yeah, so on, the, on the right side, so, on the, so this is a person who wear this camera during the day and the evening when he go home, we ask him to label by hand the segments of object that he's paid at the moment. There's a gap of six hours, roughly, uh, four or five hours. So he might put a lot of, but the, this is roughly real time. Uh, and this is obviously not real time because this is actually a camera that got out of the dog cat. <laughs> so it's dog running around. <laughs> so uh, we don't have a ground truth there. But we just can guess maybe the model we trained since the dog is a social, social animal, and maybe we pay attention to something that we're paying attention to. So yeah, so in fact, we were thinking about this could be applied to animal science and to understand what animals is pay attention to. Um, so the next thing we decided to do is to uh, focus on, on prediction of trajectories. Uh, so this is, again, if you have a first person that walked in space, uh, we know that we can actually compute all the structure of motion of that sequence. And then what we decided to do is can we learn from this 
just walking around in the city, learn how to walk in the street. Uh, so actually, this is inspired by a challenge that uh, a friend of us uh, was talking about the street, a co coalition. He said, can we have an automatic walking machine? <laughs> I said, why? Is this well, walking is hard in Japan? <laughs> so uh, I didn't quite fully understand what he did on the part. <laughs> so, so here, what we given is an image. Uh, and then, in fact, we, we have a video of how we walk into the picture. It's uh, the picture actually 15 seconds before. And it was shown in right here, it's a trajectory of you walking this way. So we, we record a video, this computer structure for motion. So we know how you moved. And then we backtrack the video 15 seconds in the past. Uh, and then we draw the trajectory into that picture. So that's basically what we did. Um, and we basically learned from that video by actually learning a new representation of the equal retina representation as opposed to the TV combined, which almost like a person view, but not quite. Uh, so just kind of show you the results we get out of it. On the left is ground trees, so how you walk, this person they walk a lot. <laughs> and then this is a right hand trajectory we find out. Uh, again, he learned to take walk in the street here also. <laughs> and here's the trajectory going to some home. And this is basically going straight. But most of the time, you can see actually trajectory can fall out. Actually, some percussions people are following people. The trajectory is just landing on that person. The indicating you're actually a follower. So if one of the trajectory is falling, one of the person is basically bifurcating and running away from that person still running. Walking outside is actually uh, not so hard because you go straight most of the time. Walking indoors is uh, a mall, it's not much hard. Uh, so this actually identifies or escalator where they are getting a new shop to go to. This is where you just walk in and go to the mall. Shops. Uh, so, so those are multiple trajectories. So this, this work is basically a simple retrieval. Basically look at this image. We retrieve all the images look like this, and then we basically plug out all the trajectories that we find as cluster them according to some sort of topological constraints, basically going around the top to the left or the top to the right. So we then uh, plot out those two cluster of trajectories. A simple retrieval task uh, is able to you know, achieve this task pretty well. Uh, we, we then tried, you know, went up this challenge for a group activity basketball. Can we predict uh, a trajectory of a person? In this case, actually, you have to predict also the head direction. So you're running one direction. Basketball players usually kind of fake to run in the other directions. So you actually have to predict also the, the head direction uh, in addition to the trajectory of um, When people are operating in a group setting, there's something called social attention. This is where they're drawing to pay attention to each other by looking at the same spot. Um, we also can. Um, we also show that you can actually infer this hotspot simply by looking at the position and the velocity of the person. Basically, then you have to base the on positions. People don't understand that position. So the position information plus the velocity information alone is indicated where it's located. We learned the model with the first person camera. So basically, we have the first person data. We can use that to find where the hotspot is. Once we have it, we Run it without uh, its uh, data for it. So, this is the trajectory we plan. Uh, and uh, for example, here, this is the trajectory we plan here. Uh, red is one, two, three, blue is the trajectory. So, relative to walking, as well as much challenge, much, much harder for a good reason. So, we can predict about two, three seconds ahead. Where walking, we can do about 15, meet, uh, 15 seconds ahead, uh, like one meter uh, gap. So, this basketball. For something like walking, how many, how many video streams do you have to collect? To... Not much, not much. I mean, we, we only have to collect eight hours of walking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's different, different people. Different people, yeah. Different people. Um, we have top K predictions, and then we pick one of the top Ks and spin up the match. Uh, and we'll get it closest to six. So, indoor is much more. Difficult because there's so many things to do. It's the less structure. Outdoor is much more. Okay, here's a road, here's an intersection. Um, uh, we actually have one work which I've not presented here and never published was basically saying that if I have a trajectory, find it out, can you give me a picture that's such that I can walk into the picture like this? So, for example, I give you the you know part of the image and say you already walked on this, but now I might want to make a right turn. 
you know, how do you make an intersection out of the street? I don't know. Well, you have to put a stop sign there. You know, take the car and move it away, right? Indoors, you need to put, you know, trash cans the right place. You need to get so we can also invert that. Um, and, and finally, this one piece work, which is really interesting, is uh, work by Sue Geddes, who is actually a basketball player himself. Uh, and he told me, you know, this basketball thing we're looking at is wrong because uh, the ball is not people's hand most of the time. Right? So there are 10 people on the court, so one ball. <laughs> you don't get much. Uh, but he said the way to study this is look at a one on one uh, basketball player. Uh, and he says at that point, you can really tell whether someone is a bas good basketball player by looking at the decision he makes. He said the basketball playing is really about decision making uh, in the split second where you have limited information coming in. It's about how fast can you make the decision with incomplete information around you. Um, so, for example, he, he says, look at this. He says, you know whether the person is leaning right or left. He says, some of the footwear is landing it. Uh, he's looking at the height of the person. He's looking at the position of the court, facing all the information to summarize and to make a decision. So what we want to do is uh, essentially learn this ability to take a picture of this person and get the trajectory that we need to score. Uh, again, we collect the 3D structured uh, motion data on the legs, you know, the ground trees, which are how you plan uh, which direction it's looking at, and why he released the ball finally. So when he shot the ball. Um, so we want to see if we can mimic this. Uh, and this is kind of the results uh, we have. Oops. Story. <laughs> Oops. Let's play this. It's not playing. Anyway, so yeah, if you imagine it's playing. <laughs> so maybe I'll play that later. Yeah. I don't know why it's not playing. Okay. But the last one, uh, besides the decision, um, um, actually, this is his chrono chronological order. Is potentially one of the first work we've done, which is uh, when I was looking at a first person video, and, and you know, we were thinking, what can we do with it? I mean, certainly, we can do stretching for motion, which is on the right. But then I realized this first person video is not about stretching for motion. Right? It's really about the sensation of you biking down the street. Yeah, you know, what people showing in this video is how cool it is, you know, how much uh, is, you know, acceleration you have going down the hill, how much pain goes through it up the hill, right? That's what it's showing. So we decided to see if we can actually invert on the video the physics of the control uh, that you feel. So the challenge turns out to be, uh, first of all, you realize all sports is really about fighting with gravity. Right? If there's no gravity, there's no actually sports. So the first thing you need to do is figure out the gravity. Uh, of course, you can put a sensor on it, but we decided to try to visually train the system to recognize gravity as well as cues about trees and so this is a 2D measurements, but then we can essentially with the 3D. The second thing we realize is the, the fact gravity is there is really helpful because it, in order to get the absolute scale of the point or speed, you need to know the somewhere this actually works. So it turns out when you turn your body lane in some direction, at the angle of leaning had to do with gravity on you. I found that you can actually figure out exactly the velocity around the uh, band. So if you just go straight, don't turn, then I don't know when it's happening, but if you turn, uh, then the force on and the angle has to be exactly proportional to the velocity. So I can figure out absolute velocity. So with all the cues, then we did a sort of inverse uh, uh, ODE system to figure out the physics. So the red indicating I'm breaking, was a point of breaking. Uh, the arrow here indicating the uh, sort of uh, the handlebar that I'm turning. Speed is the, the air drag from the so this is work by Hinshaw Park at Minnesota. So from this, we essentially can measure all the force and sensations on the video. And we thought by that time, you know, you can sell this to some theater guy who can make sure that he moves you. So now you'll see this, as you feel the sensation. Um, so we did verify this uh, by getting a volunteer and strapped it off with all kinds of sensors and then looking at his feet and the handlebars and breaking it. Um, so yeah, so we've done a lot of this work on the first person video, and it's really fun. Um, but uh, what I'm going to talk about today is really the next step in my mind, which is not finished, just talking about it, <laughs> which is about escape room. Um, the reason I'm, I was thinking hard about escape room is uh, when I realized the first person 
it's interesting is because uh, it, just like biking uh, or skiing, right? So every moment is you are alive. You're thinking hard about what to do. You're not thinking about how to take a beautiful picture. You just try to stay alive and go to the next step. So I, I can't do this on a daily basis, but I think escape room is the closest thing I can do that force you to think at all times. Right? You, you have a clock on your head, you get out of the room quickly, right? You need to solve this puzzle. Uh, so there's a lot of things to do. There's a decision to make, right? Some gambling to make, right? some memorization, you to remember what you see, a puzzle to solve. So and they had to talk to people. So it's a very rich environment where I think the first person really come alive. Not just basketball, but you are really under heavy stress to make a decision to gamble or to make choices. So we decided to collect the data sets of a uh, first person uh, escape room. Uh, we also scanned the entire room in 3D because I eventually want to turn into a VR setting where I can simulate everything. We have all kinds of camera in the first person. We have a gaze camera. This time, actually, I've got a gaze camera. So actually, you know, know exactly what a person is looking at in addition to GoPro. So in, in reverse order, what we really want to do is collect the data, do all kinds of vision processing to figure out what the gaze information are, uh, and figure out hand object. Those are two things that we're really focusing on, hand object interaction the gaze. And what we're really heading towards is uh, what we hope to get to is sort of a mental model of how we kind of visually search, um, react to objects, uh, make decisions, Choices and so on. Um, so, so yeah. So let's we'll start talking about the data that we collected. Okay. So this is a big data. Uh, oh, twenty people. But yeah. So yeah, escape room. <laughs> so, uh, so you should. <laughs> You have to escape. Yeah, literally, you, you lock into a room and there's a puzzle to be solved. It could be a crime. Uh, you need to find out who murders someone, or you need to find the, the, the lock. So I was in the jail and I need to find the key to get out. When I get out of jail, I need to, you know, code some uh, World War II uh, some message. I need to send a message somehow to some method. Somebody can get, get it and then I find the key. But time is, time is, uh, is ticking. Yeah. And there's a monitor that will look at you and occasionally give you clues since so you're looking around the direction. So you give lots of clues, you know, say, look at this book, uh, find, you know, something big. Uh, and then, so you basically have objects in the room, you need to kind of search. So our escape room, which I won't talk too much about, is uh, we made our own game. So the game is basically looking for things that could be related to each other. We didn't tell you what things could be related, but when you find it, you know. And in between, we give a lot of clues. They said, go, go read the book, look at pictures, you know, look at things not too high, but they're eye level. It's kind of cool. So, yeah. And it's about 30 people kind of finish this task. Yeah. So, for this update, like I said, yeah. a single person escape or multi So, some of them are single person, some are multi person. Uh, I don't hear the sound. <laughs> it's not really, but uh, we ask, ask people kind of to uh, speaking out aloud what they're thinking about. So, so they verbalize. When there are two persons. Yeah, so they're kind of reading the clues and as it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have some books that are wrong. <laughs> because we said that an object can be a higher quality. Everyone is higher. So it's turned out for shorter people with the objects, right? I thought I suddenly missed it. So so we put all the different things that make sense. So this is a it's a big fishing trip. <laughs> so 
the way I don't have a very precise definition when we start. So we have that, and we we we, we noticed that uh, by having a, both the first person and the third person camera, we have a better situation. So first person tell me so this is the gauge data. Tell me what you're looking at. On the right hand side is the video of the third person camera. Look at the face. This one definitely uh, one we only have one pair of uh, on the team plane with only two gates. So definitely when you look at a first person, when you look at the first time, it's very strange. You don't see much. Um, I hate looking at this long enough to really understand what's happening. The puzzle showed up. Uh, but this is just another way to present another angle of the data. We also scan the whole room with Matterport, so it's more of a 3D layout of everything. So one of the things that we're doing is register everything from first person to a view. So every pixel you have in this picture is like a unique ID in, in this world. So you have a unique identifier. So you know everything from to e. Okay. So this is showing that uh, communication is a very big part of people. Uh, sometimes people communicate a lot, but not really like, practically, like they, they don't really understand. Uh, sometimes people communicate patterns. People know each other well, tend to you know, do well, actually, even they don't talk to each other. So, so there are different behaviors in terms of communication, there are different behaviors in terms of health. Or rush you are. Some people are extremely in a rush. They just kind of constantly lost it. Some people are very methodical. They kind of look at a room, kind of scan everything, figure everything, and then they go systematically. And some people just don't pull those into one and just don't pull those in the next one. And some people are even more organized. They, they find stuff and then they lay down very methodically on the bed <laughs> to show what they have find. Uh, you know, things that I've never thought about. So it's just a very different kind of behavior, behavior patterns. Uh, so one of the first thing we decided to do is just simply make sure every day uh, everything is registered in 3D. Um, and for that, we are trying to get both the hand object segregation tools. Oh, our pod died. Huh? Uh, so it says, yeah, it's not, how do I drag it in? Okay. Well, I need to first start, no, or? Yes, this is the Okay, so basically, we uh, we have a way of uh, saying that now. Uh, yeah, so this is the first person. This is actually the Andrew, who's actually a company. The bathroom uh, after people are playing the monitor on his camera. So, this is a uh, you know, just uh, showing that we can uh, have some system of uh, detecting object of uh, distraction at the hands. So, we're going to talk a little about details how to do it later, but this is basically uh, try to narrow down the video to the object distraction. So, what you're looking at, what you pay attention to, what you pay attention to. The system is not perfect, but that's how, how we, we are trying. So we hope to automate the whole pipeline so people can play their schedule and we can send us video. We can give all the process data. Um, let me just skip a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. So you asked if there's association, right? Yeah. If we were to object. Right. So what is the idea of association? Uh, yeah, we just want to be able to track an object that, you know, I mean, in a field of view, we know this is the same object. So you have some long term memory. So the first thing we want to do is we want to put all the gates in a 2D to 3D. We want to have a 3D uh, uh, registration of the gates data. Uh, so we ran an, an offshore pressure promotion code. This is from GoPro data. So 
the profile actually is pretty high quality image, so we can actually get a reasonable PD rate. Uh, so we found that, uh, you know, this is another view of the both cameras and the camera is pointing at. Uh, we also run the same thing with uh, the, the gaze data. Gaze data is not hard to use. Uh, gaze data is uh, with lower resolution, narrow field of stretch frame, a little harder. But since we know the angle between the GoPro and the gaze data, we can basically just plug the gaze data directly uh, as a high glass factor to the GoPro image. So now we have bigger contacts and know exactly where it's going. Um, so, yeah, so, so on this, we can track all the points we've been looking at. In the 3D, we know the time and where the shoe has deployed. So, so those data are going to be used for our future analysis. So, this is exactly the base points um, where they are on the objects. So, we're not just saying that looking at this object, we know where it is on the object. Um, so, again, this is a uh, registering GoPro, Kobe, and you can actually uh, the metaphor data all in one set. Everything is projected into 3D, and you can measure where you're looking at. And what's also cool is that uh, uh, you since everything is in 3D, uh, I can literally kind of go from the first person vision, uh, segment the hand out, the object out, and plug down into 3D. So that's a sort of a weird way of seeing things where the hand is floating in space and doing things. So I can take a first person view, essentially turn it into a, a third person view. This is your hand in the 3D world. Uh, what we want to do with it is essentially eventually create a virtual simulation for everything in the room. So if you want to do prediction, we can actually physically predict in 3D environments instead of just thinking about 3D pictures and going to 3D world. Um, so this is a, 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 the, the view from your GoPro looking in your uh, into your hand and after you grab it. Uh, so yeah, so those are again. Coming from the same vision interaction from before, so lifting up. There was a little step involving calculate the distance of object, but it turns out the Kobe glass has a reasonable distance measurement. So that you pay for that distance measurement. So you know roughly how far it is from your face uh, from the GoPro and plug it out. So uh, what's also cool is you can it's many, many hands in one place. So you can sort of have a sort of a time sequence of how you interact with. Um, you know, in one view, if you want to. So these are different, you know, your hands are different hands that are kind of registered in one 3D space. So we are looking at first person view, which have very zooming details, but then we can lift it off in 3D. So it's like a 3D first person view. Um, yeah. So here's a video. It doesn't crash. So this is a fast forward motion of um, what we're looking at. Uh, this is the depth map we estimated. This is the left hand, right hand. Direction. And this is the hand segmented and then plugged back into the So the hot spot here is the base. So at this point, we have essentially finished the, the sort of data collection part. Now everything is you know condensed into a 3D environment um, and have 3D shape and position measured. So what we want to do next is really uh, try to understand memory. And if this we haven't done yet, but uh, I'm very inspired by this paper recently came out. Um, which shows that when we are trying to memorize, the task is basically memorize scenes or project arrangements. Uh, so you're given this task, you're looking at this picture. Uh, and then when you, in a recall phase, what we do is try to remember if this picture has certain things. You ask, you know, to answer some question about this picture. It turns out, People who are doing this task really well have the same surprise when you look at the empty screen as if he was looking at a real picture. So in the in the memorizing stage, he looked at the picture through this pattern. Mm -hmm. And when he if he remembered as well, um, he surprised the same way to sort of get the details out. And I probably conjecture this is actually what he has to do here, maybe he's maybe probably he's actually in sense of really which objects he's looking at. And what the paper shown is basically by looking at similarity of these uh, path pattern, you can predict whether someone is memorizing the detail or not. So there's a very strong correlation. If the gaze pattern is the same way, he is uh, remembering the detail very well. Uh, of course, there was uh, another hypothesis if he's, he's memorizing the picture, gaze together. Uh, somehow they rule that out. That's not the case. And then 
it indeed is the gaze pattern that triggered the memory. So we are kind of interesting that you know, we have the gaze data in the, in the real 3D. Um, we also interesting whether people are looking at a picture and be able to kind of remember what's in the picture. So one of the tasks we have is to say, look at the picture. It turns out what we are asking to notice is something on top of the picture. And there's a key hidden there. Right? He didn't know what before, but if he didn't see it, he would not find it. Right? So later on, he found the lock. He said, ah, he's next to the lock. So we want to know if people have certain gaze pattern uh, are able to remember you know, the details of what they're seeing. Uh, and the second thing is if you remember something that you need to look for again, you really need to know what to look for. Uh, you don't need to look all around. So the gaze pattern allow me to understand what is you need to remember. Not just a picture, right? So picture to us is not just a picture being recorded, but I think when we look at individuals, they're recording picture different. So I want to get into their head and see what that picture means to them. So what's the encoding of that picture? Found the behavior, found the gates. Yeah. Uh, years ago in the end, but there was uh, work on foliation, right. essentially you're showing a painting right. and uh, saving pictures right. and others and so on. And, and there's a lot of work on for any given picture, what is it that right. you would follow? Is right. that, yeah. In what way is that related to? Right. But here you have a purpose. You see. Right, when right. Looking for something. Right. A lot of that work had to do with not looking for anything. Right. Take a look at this. Right. So here, yeah, exactly. The before was just you know it's a beautiful picture. You just try to probably soak up as much information as you can. Here is explicitly as you remember things. So it's your 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 remember your your you have a goal to memorize the sequence. In the escape room, you have a purpose of kind of remembering what you see because you need to find an object again. Um, or you could have a specific thing you're looking for something in a picture. It would never tell you what to look for. So you just look at it. So then you're basically trying to remember everything. So it's a memory uh, task. So yeah, so I mean, this is my conjecture is by looking at the gaze pattern in 3D, uh, I probably can correlate with the uh, memory task I can do on the subject. I can ask the subject, do you remember this? Do you remember that? Uh, do this experiment in a sort of more live setting. So that's yet to be done. Uh, but quickly switch to hand object interaction. So we thought the hand interaction is not so hard because there's so many data sets already, uh, but it turns out not so, so resulting a current paper. So we look at a lot of data set out there. Uh, there's the go to click data set, go to keep your hand data set where people actually label the hand, um, more like a glove. Um, so actually that's the definition. What is a hand? Is the hand or arm or not just a glove? Uh, the 100 day of life of on day three, probably the biggest data set, 100,000 hours, uh, enabled both the left hand and right hand, and then all different type of interaction of the objects, which is uh, probably the best data sets out there. Um, and I think he has an updated version now coming. So we actually decided to, he said, go for a large quantity of label, but volume. So we collect the data about ego for e so at the kitchen, uh, 100 days of life, and our only state. Uh, we only collect about 10,000 hours of video, uh, but we have a very large diversity of objects. And we have more detail labeling of the hands. Uh, those are the left hand and the So this is hand and arm together. Um, we also label the object segmentation mask, as well as the order of interaction. So sometimes uh, this is the first order interaction. Sometimes you are using a tool to do something else, like you're using a spoon to interact with another bowl. That's a second order. We label the first order, second order interaction. So whenever you have a tool, it's usually second order. So you're not using the tool, but to describing it, you have to do it something else. So we found out that this detail labeling is very helpful for many, many tasks. One of the tasks, for example, is to recognize the object of interaction. So if we are able to train a system that uh, first of all detect the right hand, left hand, and then find out which boundary of the things actually is under interaction of something. Given that, it actually is a lot easier to recognize object interaction. So, so instead of just recognize object in the hand and try to reason the relationship, just using that order of hand and then recognize which boundaries are the interaction uh, touching the object, and then find that inferred object segmentation, we find that it's actually more reliable. Um, another thing we do is uh, even if we use a 10,000 uh, label sets, we can generate a far larger data set. Essentially, you're using this cut and paste idea where 
we will take the data, we cut out the hands, uh, then we in paint the background. So we have lots and lots of clean background we put into the database. And every time I have this picture come in, we essentially retrieve for a similar background. And then we do all kinds of tricks to put the head back in, which is the part of the image, right? So now you have a new data set of the hands and any other part. Not exactly correct. You certainly want to grab the knife and stick into a bowl, but uh, <laughs> it's close enough to give you a lot more variety of training. Um, so we, from that, we will be able to get away with the 10,000 uh, images labeled. Um, this is instead of uh, the same patient. Uh, yeah, so I can skip some of the detailed numbers. Uh, and we also have ways now. So once you have the content boundary, uh, we can also run this is using somebody else's code. So we can try to guess the 3D handles as well as the shape of object. So now we have essentially the entire path to go into a virtual environment. Quick random question. So, yeah. with the previous thing, with essentially like extremely fancy data authentication, right, right. That, have you tried doing something like these um, recent contrastive learning trends right. where people do right. more basic augmentations and try to pair up right. images and see, see what that gives you? Because it seems like here right. it's not semantically the same thing, but it's like right. functionally there's something more. Right. Yeah. We haven't done that. I mean, yeah. So, this is more kind of uh, Specific, you know, perhaps the, uh, yeah, so it's not directly access. So, yeah, we haven't done the other path. Yet, but we check them right. So, yeah, the, it, anyway, so the hidden thought in my head is turn everything to 3D. You know, so, the previous step. The reason we turn everything to 3D is eventually one of the reasons what people do by simulating in environments. Um, so, it's not just learning from experience what you're supposed to do, but actually have a simulation from the background, just double check. Um, that's my hidden message <laughs> agenda. Um, we also have found a way of, uh, uh, let me just yeah, so skip some of it, is to be able to see through the heads. So another robotic task is you just can't see them, right? So you're arriving at things. So we decided once we're able to segment the object out, and then, um, yeah, so let's see if we can play this video. Ah, very tragic. <laughs> it's not see through things. Okay. Uh, I think there's some video here. Actually, there's a video image here. Uh, you can see almost uh, where you know, the version of the hand that uh, they move across the room. And so the trick, tricky part is how to do that on a video. Make sure everything's consistent. Uh, yeah. Is there some sort of application here for like where you can, for example, yeah. Exactly. So that will be coming up. <laughs> so that's that's. Do you see that? Exit side. Uh huh. And then go to the side zero. Uh, exit slide show. Oh, we died. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me find a cursor. 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 <laughs> Here's the video. Uh, yeah. This is not for free. You're looking at the whole video. Uh, yeah, it has some optical underneath. <laughs> the first person video Yeah, Yeah. One thing to like grasp things from some other perspective, but we tend to grasp things also based on how we see things, right? Right. right. You see only what you see. Right. Is there, it sounds like this is sort of rigid in terms of trying to understand grasping, which remains a, yeah. a challenging problem. Right. 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 And exactly. it'll always remain a challenging problem. Yes. 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 Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so this is also the second. And message in my head is that one of the cat was robotics. So all the data is going to be useful for uh, figuring out, you know, when certain action starts, uh, how you kind of transition from 
the States, because you see it very clearly from your point of view. Uh, I think there was a paper from Abina uh, uh, CMA this year, they basically show using Eagle 4D data, you train, pre-train like a clip kind of a feature vector, and that pre-train the feature vector is one more useful for robotic control, because you're looking at from the same end. But here, I think it's even more information uh, that I'm using, which is the gaze data we they have. So it turns out the gaze is almost telling Telling uh, forecasting what the hand's going to do because you always look at it before you touch it, and also your 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 gaze going to detect from the thing when it's about to finish. So it's basically putting a period here. It says I'm done. My eyes is off. The hand's still doing it. So this is a very strong indication of algorithm. So you can have a very precise beginning and end, and then robotics needs beginning and end. Right? So this is a procedure to start something. And so with the gaze, you kind of know that. All right, so this button. Cool. Now it plays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I need to go to the next one. So, yeah, so the next part is a kind of fuzzy because I really want to do kind of mental model predictions. Um, so, this is a kind of a very naive view of things that we have long term memory somehow uh, by sequencing them. We have the current short term videos that take what they're looking at. And somewhere there's a fuzzy thing we call it personality. <laughs> we don't know what it is. In some very high level sense, there's three buckets of features in the environment. Things, right? So, one of the first thing I want to do is uh, to understand what actually personality means, or in this more precise case, is what are we looking uh, When we see something, what do we see? So, this is my crew uh, attempt at this problem. So, don't quote me on this. <laughs> this is just a uh, my attempt on it. So we're trying to use this idea of a masking uh, and patch. Uh, so you're looking at this object, right? And we want to mask this object out. I want to see uh, from the action you take later on, can you predict this going to be a report here? Just by yourself, you're not going to predict this report, right? There's no reason to report this out. But maybe if I found the action later, uh, I can figure out this is going to be a book in, in this location. So by this correlation, I'm trying to figure out one person looking at it, did he actually see this or not? Uh, well, what did he see? So this is a kind of wild guess. So basically, we mask this object out. Given the image at, at uh, 400 milliseconds later, we take 400 milliseconds because we know it's sort of our prior work. There's a 400 milli or 500 millisecond gap between what you look and what you do with it. It's roughly 500 milliseconds. So basically, given this picture, obviously, obviously, the location, So we want to see if uh, there's difference between different actions lead to different things. Yeah. I'm a little confused. Yeah. So first frame is present. Yeah. Future or this is the, the first frame. This is five hundred milliseconds later. Okay. And so we are masking the gaze area. Yeah. So the object you are looking at is is masked out. You don't know what's going on. And then you want to look at this picture and it's going to be. Good. Exactly. If, you're, if you know that you're staring at this thing, and then it's like, then it's like, okay, but what are these things if you're holding the object? Right. You mm -hmm. might, you might not make easy that. So sometimes you're holding, sometimes you're not holding, you're just doing something else. Mm -hmm. so, so, how could you predict that? This seems like a natural choice, right? Like, you're going to fix it up and it's like, probably it's something that I'm holding. But in the other case, when you're not holding it, yeah. how do you infer yeah. to fill in what you saw? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the question is do we only give the 500 seconds later or do we give a little bit more mm -hmm. information on the video? So, yeah, so we just borrowed this uh, teacher students network um, that people are using today. And one of the initial results, usage, there's some difference. So we have two subjects, our subject two is subject four. Uh, they both open the fridge and they are both kind of looking at it. Area of the hand, I kind of gaze through it. We don't know if you saw it or not, but in one case, it's grabbing it, one case, it's not. So, and then we, we kind of plot out the features uh, for those two guys. That's not the study. So, there's some indication that this, this sort of method is allowed me to peek into this uh, first person vision based on the action you take to infer what we actually are. This is the goal, right? I'm not sure this will get me there, but 
this is the goal is trying to figure out for him at that moment what he remember about the scene. So the about tricky. So that gave, gave me a, a more a handle on what's called the smell. So everyone's there. We see the same thing, but we don't know what he see. Based on what he sees, and then can make a decision. So if he remembered it, then he can do one thing. If he doesn't remember it, he can do one thing. You can have longer Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So yeah. So that's some, definitely something I'm thinking about. But that requires also the work of taking long-term videos, essentially compress the objects in longer video into some more compressed form. Um, talk to someone who's thinking of doing that. Work. Very interesting. Essentially, taking the video and squeeze. So one of the things that we've done with like setting the hand objects out is essentially get us to narrow down to a few moments of interaction. We set them up all the data. I can zoom into the moment of interaction. And uh, those maybe I can use as a vector to work on this the game story. Yeah. So uh so the so this is uh, answering our affordance question. So the question is uh, again, we now know what he look at it, and you can infer what he actually saw, but then we still need to know from the robotics point of view, figure out what action one can take in this environment. So obviously the affordance. And we happened to do this to furnace work uh, uh, two years ago, a year ago. And the idea is basically the same thing here. Yeah. So we have a beautiful picture like this. Beautiful, not a good picture. <laughs> now we can delete, you know, a beautiful section like this. <laughs> we can pin him out or her out. And then we can uh, know that this person actually could be here, right? We pinned it. Uh, we know that this person is running and probably another person running an action. So we have a ground truth creation so far run through by just uh, collecting lots of data. Uh, basically people celebrating success, right? So if we could just delete that person, now we know he's success, succeeded, we can give him data. So this basically the training data is this, this imprinted image is a person deleted and he had to imitate the original version. Uh, so we can put a car, delete the car, put a bounding box where it is and just put it the size of the bounding box. We can also put this uh, YZD or Data sets uh, to be the objects, and then we can ask if you want to put this object in, where it can be placed. So, learn from that. So, anyway, we have some methods of doing that. For, for people, in direction, we're doing two steps. One is first the body box, figure out how big it is, uh, how close it is, and then based on we can do the force. So, um, so, hopefully, that form, forms the social awareness and all the other good things that uh, we want. Um, we also have another system that given an image. Uh, we recover essentially the hotspot where you want to put something. So, you want to put something there. Uh, you have to decide where something will be put, so what can be put. There's only alerts, uh, bicycle to put here, this one to put here, and stuff like that. So, basically, alerts to how to add things to the scene. So, in the robotics context, we really tell you, you know, what can I do in this? Context? So, where do I, what can I put this cup? Uh, what can I walk? Um, so, on, so um, so this is our attempt to kind of learn from that uh, thing. The two has not being combined together. Our next step is trying to put our first person data, which is kind of uh, learning occlusion, I mean, before this into our simulation. Um, but this is basically what we are heading towards. It's basically, can we learn, in my mind, a superhuman model? Because we're all pretty bad it's escape room. We only escape 30% of the time. In fact, you get a quick prize if you do escape. <laughs> so, uh, and can we learn from all this stuff? So, so the idea is that we, you know, this is a virtual simulation, but uh, the idea is that we have a real room and we can turn to a virtual simulation. Uh, and then we are observing people doing things. And many times they observe things in which are not perfect. Uh, they're just suboptimal. Uh, the question is, can we kind of take uh, those suboptimal sequences and kind of combine into a super very uh, precise? Uh, so, for example, this person, you know, Try to grab stuff and put it in the fridge. One way to do it just you know grab stuff, put it in the fridge, go look for the next one, or you just find all the stuff and grab it in your hand and put it in the fridge. Right? So, so this is just a different way to do it. And um, anyway, so it's an observation. So what we want to do is uh, when we want to find essentially uh, uh, instead of planning things out like for, for reinforced learning, which is a huge planning space. So basically, we want to take the shortcuts. A shortcut is basically observation of what people have done already. So that might not be perfect, but it certainly is feasible. So it doesn't crash. 
Anyway, so if you want to plan it out, it is going to be a lot of search, uh, meaning that you need to take the data, you analyze the action the rules, right? And, and do physical simulation to do the next step. Oops. Yeah. Ah, now it's been too far. Yeah, so basically you could think about the shortcuts. Uh, <laughs> the shortcuts, which um, allow you to take human demos, so you don't have to mimic what he does. You can just copy what he does. So, and what happens? Is you only see basically few uh, demonstrations. You can think of those as a you know some kind of graph in the in, in notes in the graph where you can plan things around, but they also can just observe what people have. So you can just treat that as a kind of shortcut edge. So now you have a world made of many, many shortcuts, and there's a lot of gaps. And that's where a simulation could come in, make a planning in that and bridging those gaps. So, yeah, so this is not done yet, but this is, uh, you know, what we are heading towards with this kind of uh, setup is observing people, seeing what people do, find shortcuts, and then using the simulation to come into kind of bridge those gaps. Um, again, this is not proven theory. So, <laughs> so this is my kind of thinking on this topic. Instead of a kind of relearn from scratch, we think, uh, want to kind of borrow as much we can. Um, I think that's the main message I want to talk about. Yeah, there's not many other work, but I think uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, for people interested in kind of in painting, I just want to do advertisement for my students, Angel, who has done really fantastic work on this topic of in painting, uh, which is basically can we tell where in painting has an error? It turns out we have been studying in painting for a long time without knowing the metrics of well, what is bad in in painting. So, so, for example, this is an in painting error, right? So, you, you take the boat section off and you press on the here, don't look at both. Uh, if there's someone here, you think it looks okay, but then you can see definitely something wrong. So what uh, Lin Jie had done is actually uh, hired a lot of professional uh, maybe Photoshop users uh, and collected data by hand, you know, where is the mistakes are. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, marked, you know, so this are objects to be needed and this is the error that you find in one part, right? And found this is you to train a system to kind of replicate this uh, human and then tell you where things gone wrong. So those are the places where human errors, because there's some disagreement, right? Some people say this is wrong, this is wrong, so you say the whole chunk is wrong. So there's just different area where people make, but this enough of a consistency that I can use to kind of train the system. And, uh, and with this is, we are able to essentially uh, iteratively refine the segments or fill in, fill in. All the errors are gone. So these are just different how methods. Refine? Yeah, so how to refine is hard thing. So one of the things you can do multiple hypotheses uh, in painting. So there's a uh, you know, different parameter you can run with a different bias and you want at least. But there's more reason methods. I don't know if I should talk about it now long <laughs> because it's still being working out, but then we seem to have a lot of solution for that. But this is a basically what we uh, is very useful because now you know we can automatically you know, look at many different so this is patch matches basic uh, vision algorithm llama is probably the most advanced system today uh, only compared to WACD I don't know why this is one of the, one of the best in painting work I've seen uh, extremely high quality <coughs> and it's occasionally still making it uh, so it was able to kind of automatically label where which you know, I think is very important for not just for in painting, but actually for, for and networking and so on. Because now you can synthesize the image and actually tell where it is. Not wrong. But if you're thinking about the other problem that uh, this was actually detecting our mm -hmm. problem area mm -hmm. is that we use the forensic in a way, right? Because that's right, <laughs> defect, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Does this system also sort of help with like uh, artifacts that might be problematic for maybe your focus on system? For example, mm -hmm. like, uh, mm -hmm. I noticed in the ego sensitive video, right. uh, when you do the painting, yeah. the hand shadows don't kind of do Exactly, so that doesn't do that yet. So that we were getting there. So that requires some causality understanding. So yeah, definitely we noticed. So you're leaning against a beautiful airplane, the 
you're not trying to spar, but you're still eating. So <laughs> that's not good. Yeah. So he, he doesn't, um, well, he might be able to detect that, but uh, I don't think he's able to fix that yet. Yeah. That's a very good topic. Yeah. So anyway, so I think that, that you know, it's, it's a good work and then, yeah, hopefully it's useful for people, not just for in painting, but for any other synthesis task as well. We'll stop here. Yeah. About the gaze uh, mm -hmm. part, that you mm -hmm. mentioned, I had a question mm -hmm. about. Yeah, okay. Um, so, my question mm -hmm. was about um, the seeing versus noticing. Mm -hmm. so, so, you said that. A lot of people kind of see the same thing, mm -hmm. but then you call it memory mm -hmm. by saying whether they can call it or not. Right. I was actually thinking there might be a difference between seeing the noticing and the memory. So noticing might be another state where right. we both see the same thing, but but within mm -hmm. that, I might take away something else and you might take away something else. And I wonder if there's a correlation between noticing and how much time you spend on it. Um, so did you notice, uh, like, did you see whether, <laughs> did, um, like, whether there was more time being spent on certain things, uh, like, whether the time factor actually played a role in whether the memory, what, what you're calling memory? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have the detail, but I definitely not, noticed from the video, uh, there are people who tend to, yeah, just look at things carefully ahead of time. So they already kind of have a rough idea what it is. And then it, then, then they do it again, you know, second time around. So I think there's also repeated exposure mm -hmm. to the thing. Um, the other things I noticed, I'm just wondering why someone, you know, rearrange things. Mm -hmm. Like some people like rearrange things. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's also related to how you do that and how she can remember things. Um, yeah, like putting the bed on the bed and more putting those extreme things, but that mm -hmm. other similar things. Some people just put back where it is so they can remember. Maybe the arranging might help them and reorganize it. Yeah. Right. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, so it's related to that. I was wondering, like, um, you mentioned that the way in which your gaze moves can be an important sort of indicator for how well you memorize the scene, right? right? Or how well you remember the paper. I wonder if that function is sort of, if it is both a function of how you're gazing at the objects plus the three stuff. Because, like, different gaze patterns would be important. But, like, if, like, if there's some sort of object uh, right. that's completely convex on one side or something like right. that, right? So, if there's, yeah. yeah, I think it's more about, yeah, the repeatability of the gaze pattern. If you look at things again and again the same way, that's probably an indicator of remembering it. Once you remember it, you're probably going to look at it in the same way the next time. So, yeah, probably, yeah. There is some 3D affordance related to that. You probably want to find the simplest way to remember the gauge pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it must be something that you would think about. Mm -hmm. One question about the gaze reference. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming it's the, the actual gaze, not like the little the random stuff that you get, right? Mm -hmm. you, are we able to try surprise? And if so, are you considering including that in your personality and stuff? Yeah. Really so Toby Glass gave you some classification of Sigma versus this uh, random jiggering. Mm -hmm. um, and you really look at how good it is. Mm -hmm. so some classification of it, like fixating versus sacrating versus yeah. this. Because I remember reading an article about how when you're more focused, you end up having more more Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you.